All right, let's go ahead and start. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole. Um, welcome to the Ventura County Master Gardener Series. Um, tonight's talk is sponsored by Cayugas Municipal Water District. Today's presentation, Growing California Natives, will be about an hour with time for questions, but we ask that everyone stay muted. And also our speaker today is Danny Brucius. She is a sustainable landscape expert with training in firescaping, arboriculture, plant biology, soils, garden pests, and diseases. In 2005, Danny graduated from the Master Gardener program and has over a decade of training in community service at the helpline desk. Today, you will learn how to grow a California native plant garden, learn when is best to plant natives, their maintenance needs, and other important information about these beneficial drought resistant plants. Danny? Uh, thank you. Thank you for um, everybody for coming. Okay, so on to natives. Why natives? Okay, natives are the plants that have evolved over time, creating balance and sustaining critical habitat for our native bird and wildlife species. Um, they invite beneficial pollinators and consumers. So um, I included this because here's the ladybug. She's um, eating aphids. Um, here's the ladybug. This is on the underside of a leaf. This ladybug's tending her eggs here. So if you see these little yellow barrel shaped things on the underside, don't wipe them off. They're ladybug eggs. And um, <laughs> this prehistoric looking dude here is actually the immature of a ladybug. So don't freak out if you see him, it's going to turn into that one. So also, this is really important right now is the natives can serve water. And that is, I can't um, tell you this enough. It's once they're established, we have to establish our native plants before they come drop tolerant and conserve water. They are low maintenance. So they might give you the summer off. A lot of native plants don't do much in the summer. And don't get it confused. Um, native plants also do need maintenance. Um, they're not as high maintenance. I am the I'm the lazy gardener, so I love the native plants because they're they're pretty low maintenance. Um, they're healthy because they do not require pesticides and chemicals, and they're healthy for the planet because there's reduced pollution because you're not using mowers and blowers. Um, you add that to the carbon storage for the long lived trees and plants, and that equals a reduced carbon footprint, which is really important right now. And best of all, they are beautiful. And these are tidy tips. <laughs> and I cannot grow tidy tips for the life of me. I have a meadow and these should grow fine. I can't grow tidy tips. So um, bringing a few different plant types, we're used to the exotics. Now this isn't anything close to like the invasive plants, but the exotics are the plants that we brought in from other places. And when you have a base, when you have a mostly exotic um, landscape, you don't have a lot of insects because insects are host specific and we don't get the same insects maybe that these plants, where these plants came from. And you might think, oh, that's a good idea. You know, I'm not gonna have the bugs, but you know what, if you don't have any bugs, you don't have any birds. And then the next step is the invasive plants. So what happens with the invasive plants is they choke out our native plants and um, the native plants are essential to keep everything going. This is my, my, <laughs> my pet peeve of invasive plants is this Penicetum cetaceum. It's the green fountain grass. Okay, so this is um, from my neighbor's yard and my neighbor said, oh, this must be a native plant. It just, I didn't plant it, it just grew here. Well, know that if it could be a native plant if it just grew there, I, I have several in my yard. But note if it's something that's gonna grow in the gutter, um, it, it's probably an invasive. And, where what invasive plants do is they they first um, find themselves they they um, find themselves in the cut areas 
So here we have a park and this is the cut area and this is where all this is where they started. Um, a good place where you can think of them is if you go through the Conejo grade, you'll see a lot of these plants because those are the cut areas. That's where they first go. But what's going to happen is later, this is um, the same park down here and kind of over here is where they started. And now they're in the wildlands. And that's once they get in the wildlands, they choke out the native plants. So what should I plant? Okay, we're not gonna tell you what to plant. Everybody has a different idea of what looks good, okay? But we're gonna give, we give you the tools to find things that you like that you might want to plant. So for California natives, the upside, there's a lot of varieties available. Um, right now, there's a lot of people going to buy native plants. So there might be a shortage of some plants from you know, maybe last year. Um, but there are, it used to be you used to have to go to a, a native nursery, but now most nurseries have a have a native section. So um, they're slow growing. The slow growing plants in your landscape, those are the enduring plants. Those are the plants that are gonna look better year after year. Um, they're drought tolerant. Um, most of them are drought tolerant. Um, some natives that come from riparian areas are not gonna be so drought tolerant. Um, there's no fertilizer needed. They don't like fertilizer. You know, you can cut that off of the um, CO2 emissions. <laughs> Um, they attract native pollinators. And once again, I'm the lazy gardener. They can give you the summer off because most of them aren't doing a lot during the summer. Okay, the downside, they look ugly in the nursery pot, but our nurseries are getting better at this. Um, you go to a nursery and you see your, the, you, you see all these um, hybrid plants and they've got big, beautiful flowers and stuff. And then you go to the native section and sometimes they look like sticks and pots. So it's a good idea. You don't wanna to go to the nursery and just look and pick from what's there. You kind of wanna at least have your phone with you. So you know what this plant is going to turn into what it's gonna look like. Um, also they're slow growing. So some people want instant gratification and it takes a while for them to fill in. And, and um, when, one thing that you can do is throw a bunch of poppy seeds out there. And if you've got poppies growing, it looks like everything's filled in. Um, they can be picky with our adaptive conditions. Okay, so we're used to watering and watering and watering. And a lot of the native plants, so some of them um, don't like any summer water at all. And, you know, what could be more perfect right now that we're in water restrictions and, and drought? and um, drought. So, and also they may go dormant in the summer. So when you're picking your native plants, you wanna make sure that you have some plants in your landscape that stay green throughout the year because you don't want everything just going brown or you probably have the fire department knocking on your door about July. So just because a plant is a native does not mean that it will work in your landscape, okay? We've got, this is a big state. We've got everything from the Sierras to the coast. So you should stay as close to your plant community as you possibly can. So choose wisely and also consider the mature size. Now these aren't necessarily natives, but this is what happens when you pick that cute little plant at the nursery and you decide to plant it. Now, this is at Bed Bath & Beyond in Westlake. And I'm guessing this was done by, by a professional. And it was, you know, you know the, it was cute when it was there and the professional's gone now. He's got his money. <laughs> and this poor tree's looking for the sun. Um, this, is a, this is a star pine. This is one of those little um, trees that you buy in the market around the holidays and you think you're going to plant it and they get huge. And this one, this is a native, this is a coast redwood. Um, we want to keep the redwoods. Um, there's a reason that they're called coast redwoods is because they don't do very good inland. 
And um, you, we want to, especially in these drought times and fire times, we want to keep them as far away from homes as we can. Keep them on the outskirts. If, if this um, catches on fire, the house is toast. So basically what you're going to do is spend some time in your yard because the better you know your yard, the better your results are going to be. Excuse me. Okay, so there's microclimates in your yard. I have a small yard and I still have several microclimates. So there's going to be areas in your yard that are, that are um, sunny, um, windy, especially today. If, you, if, you're, if you're prone to winds, especially against walls, that's going to increase the velocity of the wind and it's just going to be, beat your plants to death. Um, shade areas and areas that stay wet. And also um, compass direction is a big deal. Um, and if you pair that with topography, say you have a slope, a, a south facing slope, that's going to dry out a lot faster. So, you know, those are like the areas that you're going to put your more drought tolerant plants. And I, I keep on coming back to this sketch. I like it because somebody, they, they marked where the soggy area was, but the, the important stuff here that I like is the nice view. That's something that we always, uh, that, you know, sometime we forget about a view. And if you look around, if you have a, a nice view, it's, you might want to put some pavers there, maybe put a bistro table or something like that so you can enjoy the view. Because that, that is part of, you know, what's your landscape if you're not going to enjoy it. So areas by walkways and streets will dry out faster. So that's where you're going to put your super drought tolerant plants. Okay, this is a ceanothus. Um, this is a conejo buckwheat. Here's the conejo buckwheat, and behind it is the um, woolly blue curls. Okay, these are all plants that will do fine all summer without any water whatsoever. Um, if you've got, we replaced our turf with a meadow planting. So this is it's this is a moderate amount of water. This is something that probably in the fall it probably gets without rain it probably gets watered twice a month. And this is what it looks like in spring. <laughs> and this this to me is pretty amazing, but you have to know that you're you're not going to get this out of your plants all the time. So this this was this year midsummer what it looked like. Um and it wasn't really pretty, but I think it looked better than a lot of the brown lawns. And this was just a few days ago. And because I live in a wooey, which is a wildland urban interface, everything gets all the grasses and stuff get cut down, cut down to the, the ground in September, October before the Santa Ana start. Um, this was cut down maybe three weeks before and it was cut all the way down. So things that are like your deer grass and stuff like that, that's going to come back. And it's it's the grasses and stuff are already starting to come back. So um, now it's time to put on your research goggles and find native plants. So where do we go to find our native plants? Um, the Arboretum, the, the Arboretum All-Stars is from UC Davis Arboretum. And not all the plants there are natives, but you can you can go to the search database and you can put natives if that's if you only want natives and um, come up with their plants. And, and the cool thing about the Arboretum All-Stars is these are plants that have actually been tested in our area. So if you go to the site, you pick up a plant, this is the information that you're going to get from that site. There's also a few... Um, planting guides too. There's not a whole lot of um, design guides, but there's a few there. Um, so you can also download the brochure from their site, which is has a lot of really good information on it. It's got planning information. It's got scientific names, common names, um, which is something to keep in mind because, um, oh, it was the African daisy. I've been trying to think of this for two days. 
<laughs> that was a plant. I thought I knew what an African daisy was, but somebody, there's another plant in some other areas that they're calling an African daisy. So when you go by the common names, you're not really sure what that, that plant could be something else. They could be calling it something else from a different area. And um, what's cool about the, the um, brochure is it's got it's got pictures, but then it's got it tells you what the needs are and the water needs, and it tells you what the maintenance of these plants is, and that to me is important. <laughs> okay, another site. This is really great. The Calscape from the California Native Plant Society. Great pictures. They also have an interactive map, so. You can go to your area and see what grows best in your area. Now, just for the whole state, they have 7,988 plants that are native to California. So you should be able to find something. And right now, it's a little bit hard at the nurseries to find the certain native plants that you want, but they they are I they are propagating them and they should, you know, if you're looking for a certain plant, they should be available. Um, I'd always check before you go to a native plant nursery. Most of them have um, their inventory online. And this is something that I'm gonna get to a little bit later from the, sa from the same Calscape. It's, uh, um, hel it helps you um, design. So it's good to know before you start, some native plants can be very picky. And this is the, this is the seven-year-old in me that where I actually found a picture of a guy picking his nose. <laughs> so some of the plants that are picky that don't want any supplemental irrigation during the summer. Okay, flannel bush, bush poppy, woolly blue curls. This is just a few, but it's to give you an idea. And then there's plants that are predisposed to disease when they're irrigated in the summer. And these are two of them, the manzanitas and the ceanothus. Those are ones that were, they were a lot more popular in the landscape a little while ago. And I think designers quit using them because they were short-lived, but they weren't short-lived because they were short-lived plants. They were short-lived because we were watering them three times a week during the summer. And um, they, they didn't last too long. So here's the flannel bush. Um, usually, in, I know in my area, you see this more um, trimmed up as a tree. I thought this was an amazing picture. It's um, don't do this though, <laughs> because now because of fire dangers, we're not supposed to plant anything, nothing flammable within the first five feet of your structures, but it looks pretty cool. And it's got really nice, um, really nice flowers. Um, the bush poppy, this is one, this is literally across the street from my house. And this plant has um, another problem with some of the native plants is they have really sensitive roots. And I have, I've tried three times and I've never been able to get this one established. And I think sometimes if you just, you take it out of the pot and you look at the roots wrong, it's, it's not gonna go for you. But like I said, this is literally across the street in the open lands. And um, it, it's a really neat plant when you see it. Um, this is another one that's supposed to be hard. I didn't have a problem with it. This is the woolly blue curls. Um, another one that doesn't want any summer water whatsoever. Um, and it's got the, it's got a perfect purple smell to it. The, it's, um, it, if you could, if you could um, imagine the color purple, what it smells like, that's what this plant is. And for the ones that, um, manzanitas, they'd probably be okay with um, once a month watering. Um, they, they also don't like supplemental water during the summer. Um, then the ceanothus and ceanothus will handle some summer water, but know that if you're watering them a lot, they're going to be a lot shorter lived. So what you need to do is make a list, make a list of on one side, put the plants that you like, and on the other side, put the areas that you have. And I crossed out this under the eaves because once again, that's the area that holds most water.
but um, you're not supposed to plant within five feet of structures, especially if you're in a in a wooey in a wildland urban interface. So you're going to group your plants by water needs. Okay, that's called hydrozoning. So where can I find the water requirements for my plant list? Okay, you already made a plant list, right? <laughs> okay, so this is the Wukul's, the Wukul site. It's the water use classification of landscape species. And before um, the California Center for Urban Horticulture put this together out of UC Davis, and before this site, it was all pretty much hearsay, you know, oh, well, I think this needs a little water. This needs a lot of water. This one's going to tell you they got all the professionals and, and, um, and the professors and everybody together, and they decided what plants work well. So um, there's the plant list and um, the database. So if you go into the database here, uh, all I put in was um, Agora Hills, which is region three. And I didn't, you could break this down further if you want very low, low water, moderate water plants, but I just put California natives. And for Agora, they came up with 717 different plants. Um, not everything's got pictures in here, but there's a lot more pictures than there used to be. So, you know, it's a, it's a good idea to, to know what plants you're looking for ahead of time. And this is when you go to their page, this is the information you get on the certain plants. And, and here we have the, the margarita bot penstemon again. <laughs> and this keeps on coming up in my talk because this is a plant, if you plant this plant, people will stop and ask you what it is because it, it just, it stands out that, the colors stand out that much. So now what? Okay, from the um, California Native Plant Society, there was that little thing at the bottom that I showed you. They have a garden planner that helps you. You put in your zip code and you tell them what kind of a yard you're looking for and it helps you pick out plants and stuff. So if you need help with your design, this is a good place to start. And note that size matters, okay? so. Anything larger than a one gallon pot is gonna need more care and take more time to establish. And a plant in a one gallon container will usually catch up to its five gallon neighbor in a year or, year or so. So, um, you know, I know the big plants look really nice, but um, <laughs> but sometimes I do have a, I have a um, desert willow tree that I probably bought 10 years ago and it's, I bought it in a one gallon pot and it's still one of those plants where you, you say, um, don't, don't step on the tree when you walk by. <laughs> and the ones that I bought in the bigger pots um, are big, huge trees now. So, so um, take what you want out of that. So, but note that native plants in root bound pots um, usually aren't gonna, they're gonna survive a lot less than, um, during transplant. So try and look and check the bottom and try and not get plants that are root bound because a lot of the native plants have more sensitive roots. So here's, um, this is, uh, I used to be on the landscape committee and um, to save money for the city, they decided to interdisperse the the 15 gallons in the 24 box. And I can't tell you which tree was which here, but I am positive that this one, the, the littlest tree on the end was one that was in a 24 inch box because that was the first one in the community and they wanted it to be the little, the showplace. So um, it's important to decide what you want from your garden. Um, do you want to attract pollinators? Okay, so butterflies and bees feed in full sun. So those plants that the pollinators are going to feed on are going to are going to have to be in full sun. Um, choose a variety of plants that bloom throughout the year. Um, this is important because especially that we've got the migrating monarch, and when you think of the monarch butterfly, 
you think that, okay, I'm going to plant a lot of milkweed and, and, and that's wonderful. That's, that's great for the caterpillar. But um, when these guys migrate, when they, when they go on vacation, um, they need to stop along the way and um, get, get nectar from the flowers for nutrition and there's not a whole lot of flowers that, that bloom in the fall. So um, try and think about that. Um, the the ast aster family, the asteraceae, um, the, there's quite a few plants in the aster family that, that do bloom in the fall. So bees like floral consistency. So if you're gonna plant bee plants, if you wanna bring in the bee pollinators, um, they like um, a, like a, a meter square or a three foot square patch of the same plant. They like floral consistency. So if you have a plant like a, a big, the Ceanothus concha, you're only going to need one of those. But if you've got the little, the little red um, buckwheats, you, you might need a half a dozen of those. Um, butterflies like inflorescence. So what an inflorescence is, it's a, like from the Asteraceae family, it's a it's a flower that's got a lot of little flowers on it. So they can just um, stop and get a lot of nectar from a lot of little flowers on, on one plant. So how about bird watching? I, I love the birds. So if you like the birds in your yard, um, nesting areas, plants that supply berries, um, the toyon is good for that. Um, plants that supply seeds, um, so don't deadhead all your plants right away, you know, let some of them go to seed. Plants that supply nesting materials and yes, plants that attract insects. So here is, this is, I was sitting out front <laughs> on my bench and this is the, um, this is a sage, I'm not sure what sage, but if you look, you see there's a whole flock of little birds in there just eating the bugs off it because there's not seeds on the stage yet. It hasn't gone to, so they're just in there. They're just feasting. They're just feasting on the, <laughs> on the bugs. And, and that's kind of cool. <laughs> okay. So native gardening is easier than you think. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm the lazy gardener. <laughs> this is why I started native gardening. Um, Forget everything that you've learned about gardening, okay? Because, you know, maybe your grandmother from Minnesota told you to use Epsom salts on your roses, and that's not what we do. It's just native gardening is just super easy. All you need to know is the water requirements for your plants, the soil requirements for your plants, and, and the soil requirements are usually just well draining. Um, the sun and shade requirements, and then mulch, what kind of mulch they like. So when should you plant? <laughs> you should plant now. <laughs> this is, well, when it's not windy. This is like the perfect time to plant in the fall. Um, it's, it's the days are, the days are shorter and the temperatures are cooler and um, you're not going to be watering so much. So before you plant, if you're replacing a lawn, know that just because your lawn looks brown now, it may not be dead. You're gonna need to remove that lawn. Um, there's other methods like um, sheet mulching and stuff like that. But uh, you, you can't, just because it looks brown doesn't mean it's dead. We've got co mostly cool season grasses here. So once it gets in the cool season and it rains a couple of times, it all starts coming back. So you're going to water well after you remove and remove any new weeds. Um, don't till because you're going to get more weeds. We have something called a weed seed bank and you don't want to bring those up to the surface. Um, don't add any amendments and um, water your plants a day ahead of time. So planting basics, which are also, um, there's information in the All-Stars brochure. Um, your hole should be no deeper than the soil in the pot. And we used to tell you at least twice as big as wide as the pot, but that's that's just old, old hat now. Um, just leave enough room so you can um, fill it in in the sides with the new, new um, soil. 
Um, so you're going to fill the hole with water, let it drain, um, tap the pot, try not to mess with the roots. <laughs> and the stir roots are the best. But if you've got a root bound mess, um, gently try to loosen it. Um, backfill with native soil. Don't add amendments. Um, your plant should sit slightly above grade because it's it's going to on firm ground because eventually it's it's going to sink down and you don't want that one part of the plant you don't want that where the roots and the plant meet you don't want that part to be underground. Um, let's see, tamp down. Don't <laughs> shove it down there, but just try and remove any air pockets and, and don't add fertilizers. So after you plant, you want to water deeply and you're going to mulch around the plant, but not at the crown. You don't want that crown area, the part that you just put in the ground. You don't want that area staying damp because what happens is that invites a lot of nasty diseases. Um, and add a rock. They always told me to add a rock and I never knew why I was adding a rock, <laughs> but I did it anyway. But the reasoning behind that is if you've got like a southwest facing um, area that if you put a rock in front of there, it's it's going to shadow some of the area and that that sensitive part of the plant. So no when to water. So no plant is drought tolerant until it's established. An establishment is once the roots grow into the native soil. So it's important to keep the root ball moist. So when you're watering these plants, when you put them in, you're gonna water directly on the root ball, the part that was in the pot. Um, so the Wukal site with the water requirements, those are for established plants only. So before maturity, most plants are high water users. And here it's trees take three to five years of regular water until they're established. but um, Water them a lot the first three to six months. And after that, you can usually cut back about half of the water, but you're still going to have to water them regularly until they're fully established. Um, trees, especially native trees, once they're established, they can probably get by with um, two or maybe three um, deep waterings a year. Uh, so let's see. Okay. Water the entire root ball in the surrounding soil because you want the roots to go into that surrounding soil. Um, you kind of have to get to know your soil because sandy soil, the water's going to move straight down and everybody hates their clay soil. But in drought time, this is the perfect soil. It's um, the water spreads out instead of going straight down and the clay holds on to water a lot longer. So um, you're not gonna be watering, you're not gonna have to water it as often. Um, the new plants water when the top three to four inches are dry. Um, the little tiny plants um, when the top one to two inches is dry. And know what to look for for stress. So the signs of stress on your plants are gonna be wilt, color change, or leaf drop. And um, a lot of the times that can be too much water or too little water. If a plant wilts, it, it could be either. So um, just note that if um, your plant looks kind of wilty and the top couple of inches of soil are still moist, you probably shouldn't be watering it. It's probably got too much water. So for natives, when your plants are established, um, especially if you've put in um, the drip system, um, instead of the little the emitters, the little drip, drip, drip emitters, it's best to use these micro sprinkler heads because what happens with the drip is it's going to saturate the soil and most native plants aren't used to saturated soil. They're better with the, the light little sprinkling, which was like normal when we had normal rain patterns. So mulch is, um, mulch is on top of the soil. Um, it has all these great things. It prevents evaporation. It, it saves a huge amount of evaporation, like up to 50% of the evaporation can be saved just from mulching your soil. Um, suppresses weeds, controls erosion. Um, and if your mulch is organic, it's going to add nutrients. And by organic, I don't mean organic like the whole foods way of organic. Um, organic in the scientific 
um, way is just something that comes, you know, that that was grown. So the the barks and the woods and stuff like that, they're going to break down. So um, mulch chips, three to six inches deep. If you're in a wooey, a wildland urban interface, I suggest going no deeper than three inches. Um, keep it away from the crown of the plants. Um, size matters. Um, you should probably go with at least the medium sized bark. I know the really fine barks look pretty, but they tend to mat and they tend to impede with um, water and air infiltration. So know, oh, and know what your plants want. So if you, you go out and you, you see the oak trees, the, the, like the Quercus labata, the, the deciduous oak tree, it, it has that duff layer and that's what it wants. That's where it's getting its nutrients and stuff. Um, if you go to the desert, so if you're planting cactus and succulents, um, they like rocks. <laughs> They're very easy. They, they just, they like rocks. So um, after establishment, okay, so your plants are establishment. So occasional watering may improve appearance, especially if you, you use like, um, if you saw the, my meadow area, um, that probably gets once a month watering. Um, now I don't know. Now I'll water it before the, the Santa Ana's come. Um, if you choose plants from out of your area, they're going to need some summer water, um, sandy soil. Like I said, the water's going to move straight down through sandy soil. So you might need more irrigation and note that the chaparral shrubs are the ones that are from our area are, um, sensitive to summer water. So we have to be careful with that. Uh, rules of watering are early morning. Um, frequency depends on your soil. If you've got clay or sand, um, drip emitters, they're fine for establishment. But, you know, if you're you're watering that root ball, you're going to have to move those emitters out once the plants are established. And most drought tolerant plants can handle a watering schedule of one time a month. How <laughs> how wonderful is that when we're on water restrictions? So here's some natives. Um, hopefully most of these are available, at least in the native plant nurseries. Um, this, these are all from my yard. I, <laughs> this woolly, except for this woolly blue curls, this one is, um, this one was on the edge of a dump site at a park. So, um, this plant with no extra anything can look that good. That's pretty cool. Um, some, oh, okay. As far as the, the manzanitas and the watering, there's a baby bear manzanita seems to be a bit more tolerant of, um, landscape water. So if you have, I did lose a plant, a uh, manzanita in that same spot a few years before because of my neighbor's watering habits, because, and, but this one seems to do pretty good. And thistles, um, if you see the purple thistles, they're invasive in our wildlands, but we do have a native one. We have this red thistle and it's it's really mean, but it's really pretty. And um, the Conejo buckwheat, this is a plant. If you can find this plant, um, I'd say um, plant this plant by all means. This is an amazing plant. So if you have the wet areas in your yard, areas that, that um, maybe in a flat area that tend to puddle, that don't dry out, the, the irises do really good there. Um, the Conejo buckwheat, once again, I, I was just at um, a native plant nursery and they did have a sign for the Conejo buckwheat and they did have another sign that said that there was a three plant limit, but they didn't have any at the time. But I, I know that, so, but they're still propagating them. So, um, this is this is a really cool plant, and it's got the the white, the the silver leaves on it, which are really cool. If you've got um, in a garden in moonlight, because they kind of glow. Um, coyote mint, that's a good trailing um, ground cover type plant, or you could use it as an edging, and um, it's it's very aromatic. It smells really nice. 
and the poppies. We all know poppies. Everybody likes poppies. And like I said, that's a really good fill in while you're waiting for your plants to establish. And this is one, <laughs> this is the cliff maids. And I told you the plants in the, the nursery, you know, they look kind of, this is what this plant looked like when I brought it home from the nursery and I planted it. And um, it's been a few years and it hasn't plants, it hasn't bloomed since. So, <laughs> so you never know. <laughs> um, monkey flower, that's a good one. That's a native that's on the sides of, if you go like over Canaan and the canyons and stuff, you'll see that one growing. And this is one that might fool you. If it gets real hot, it will go dormant. So um, don't be digging it out because you think that it's dead. If it's been really hot, it might just um, have gone dormant. And here's the Margarita Bot Penstemon. This one's, this one's pretty available. And like I said, this is the plant. If you plant it, people will stop and ask you what it is. Um, it stays green all year. It blooms. It has a pretty long bloom season and these flowers change and it doesn't get really big. So it's, it's, um, doesn't take over your yard. And it is, I have this in two areas of my yard. I have it in the super drought tolerant area and I have it in the meadow area and it does fine in both areas. And if you, um, <laughs> it, it's named the Margarita Bot Penstemon because if you, if you, if you um, discover a plant, you get to name it. And this was found at the Margarita, the, the Las Politas Nursery at their Margarita, Santa Margarita um, Nursery. And they found BOP st stands for back of porch. So something, it sounds like a party and it's just something that grew on the back of the porch. <laughs> um, Here's some, this is a, this is added, I have this in my super drought tolerant area too, and it seems to do fine. And I'm far from Santa Cruz. I have no ocean influence where I am, but this is a really pretty pink flowering um, buckwheat. And then there's the deer grass and they are um, flammable. So um, they, um, they stay green all through the summer, but um, cut them back at fire season and the California fuchsias and these come in all different sizes and different colors and they bloom for a really my my fuchsias are still they're still blooming out front and they're actually these are the hummingbirds like these um hummingbirds like any flowers that have tubes so with that <laughs> <laughs> say thank you um this is these are the conejo buckwheat and these are the the red thistle and this is the bunny reading the sign that says protect our wildlife so um here's our contact um, at the master gardener helpline for gardening questions it helps if you know what kind of plant you have and the as much information as you can give us is like the watering schedule what you've you know maybe you sprayed something on it or something like that that that's less back and forth when we ask you questions um you can send us pictures we love pictures if you send us pictures a close-up picture of the problem a far away picture of the entire plant and then um maybe a picture around the bottom of the the soil area um, that can help. And with that, here's my resources. Oh, and here's the, the California Native Plants for the Garden is a great book. And I, I recommend it because that is the book that when you go to the native plant nurseries and um, you see the designers walking around, that's, that's the book that they've got a clipboard and then they, that's the book that they're carrying with them. Because then and if that's um, something you can take to the nursery, it, you know, but you can take your phone with you too. So um, that's all I have. <laughs> Are there any questions? So we have one question. What is a good ground cover that's in place of grass for your dogs? Okay. Um, well, okay. So so I'm kind of torn on this because um, there is, there are, turf is, isn't all bad. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's good grasses and, and it's going to be hard to have something for your dogs. You know, your dogs are going to make runways <laughs> on anything besides grass. 
and there are drought tolerant grasses and um, especially you don't have to do the whole yard in them but right now they're research there's research out of um you see you see uc verde buffalo grass you um, see riverside riverside right yeah. now they have um they're studying some grasses and they have two brand new grasses that are um they don't even have names yet that there's that are still in the trial stage but um like i said that there's there's a lot of bad things that people are saying about turf and and I'm against turf in areas that don't have a use but um if you you know if your your dogs need <laughs> need turf but you know hopefully you know there's there's nothing that's going to hold up as strong as a as a turf and there there is the buffalo grass and uh, but like I said there's a there's a couple new ones that are coming out that are really promising that use a lot less water and um and I'd suggest you know just maybe using them in areas like having a dog area UC Center for Urban Horticulture which is from UC Davis um has the information on some of those uh, drought tolerant gra grasses. Yeah, and the, and also turf helps helps to cool things too. So it's um, you know it 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 does serve a purpose. Just you know for the the you know you don't want your kids playing on plastic and you, and you and you want to put the dogs you know have the dogs have a place to go that's not going to burn their feet like the fake grasses. But just keep in mind, like Danny has been saying, that any of these um, drought tolerant grasses are, um, they do take water more so than maybe a, a shrub would, and um, they need time to get established. So they will use more water than, than you think. So just use it. If you're going to use it, make it a small area. And just know that if we go into, into complete water restriction, it might be a problem to get water to it. So one another question, um, besides rocks for mulch, is there another mulch that works in a fire area? Well, uh, okay, so they say to use, um, I, I changed my, everything within five feet of the structure is now rocks. And I use like egg size rocks and the plants are doing fine. I kept the the other mulches, um, the the wood mulches. Um, I still have those and anything farther back because you know that's what the plants like. Um, it's it's like I said, a mulch is anything that you put on top of the soil. Um, I would go with the less um, the stuff that comes from the chippers is going to be less fire prone. And there is research out there, and I believe we have a link to it on our Master Gardener site. There's a drought button on the left side of the page, and I believe there's a link to the research that they did on the different kinds of mulch that mm -hmm. tells you the, the, how high the flame gets and how easily it spreads and things like that. But probably the best stuff is that comes right from the, the chipper. And I did learn something new is you get the bark mulches from, from like um, the, the home stores and stuff like that. But what you, the bark mulch isn't going to break down as easily because the bark, what is bark? Bark is, isn't alive. It's the outside of the tree and it protects the tree. So it's not going to break down real easy. So what you want to use is actual wood mulch, which is like I said, the stuff that comes from the chippers. And that was the that was the one that did the best in the, the fire trials that they used too. But rocks within <laughs> within five feet, um, rocks, rocks work well. <laughs> and mine look kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. Good I enjoyed everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.